But the fact that the U.S. is collecting this data, I, I don't think we should all be surprised about this. Well, you're a diplomat. I think people in the public would be rather surprised. But, Greg Mitchell, what is your take on this? Well, it's interesting how the different news outlets have handled. As, as you mentioned, The Guardian is, uh, was one of their featured, uh, featured articles and went into great detail about the U.N. angle, where The New York Times uh, had a much, much uh, less detailed, uh, uh, softer, gentler version of that. So um, now maybe The New York Times is trying to say they are not babes in the woods and, uh, you know, they, they know this is going on. It's they hard for me to with believe. the iris scans to yeah. emphasize the fingerprints right. and the biometric. Right. It's, it's hard for me to believe that uh, the long list of this is not something that, that is new, the, the full extent of it. And, and as someone pointed out, uh, even if it's not that shocking, it must be exhausting for the asking these diplomats, diplomats around the world to do this work instead of the important work they're supposed to be doing. They have a you know, long checklist to go through on what they're supposed to do to contribute to this intelligence gathering. I wanted to bring Asad Abu Khalil into this conversation, professor of political science at California State University, Stanislaus, visiting professor at UC Berkeley. Uh, is the author of the book, The Battle for Saudi Arabia, which is what I want to go to right now. Uh, the diplomatic cables around Saudi Arabia f calling for the attacking of Iran. Uh, can you summarize what the cable said and then your response? Well, I mean, much of the cables about Saudi Arabia uh, shows a very high degree of control by the U.S. government over the policy decisions that are made in Saudi Arabia. I mean, at one point, there is an American specific request issuing what, what reads like command, asking the Saudi government to go to China and to um, undertake a certain mission on behalf of the United States vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, uh, the situation in Iran. And I think that the extent to which the Saudi government and all Arab governments in the Gulf are embarrassed by these leagues is evidenced by the clampdown that is being exhibited throughout the Saudi-controlled Arab media and even the so-called independent Al Jazeera, which is, contrary to its reputation here in the West, is the most serious news organization in the Middle East, is also trying to cover up the embarrassing revelations about the way Arab governments operate vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And you have to take into consideration that much of the discussions and the utterances and statements that are made by Arab leaders at the highest level in these documents are in direct contradiction with their public declared policies are made in Arabic to their people. I was, wanted to ask Asad Abu Khalil if you can go a little closer to your computer so we can hear you more clearly. Um, Asad Abu Khalil again um, is a professor uh, visiting at UC Berkeley. He's the author of The Battle for Saudi Arabia and runs the Angry Arab News Service blog. Uh, if you could now continue with exactly what was said um, uh, by, uh, by Saudi Arabia in conversation with who in the United States? Well, I mean, there's more than one conversation is revealed in those documents. I mean, I've read all those pertaining to the Middle East that were released on the various websites and so on. Uh, I mean, for example, there is one discussion conducted between the king of Saudi Arabia, who rarely has these kind of discussions with even his counterparts in the region, but he is willing to meet with a relatively lower ranking official, say, of Department of Homeland Security. And the discussion goes on about a variety of issues related to what is of interest to the American government. What is very striking to me, for example, you take the issue of human rights. I read what was released yesterday, and I am not struck, really, that the U.S. government does not bring up human rights except in one meeting between American congressional delegation and the Syrian president. And at one point, the Syrian president told them I mean, to, the, what, to what amounts to, what about Saudi Arabia? Because in a meeting between an American official from Homeland Security and the Saudi king, not only does that American official not bring up the human rights violation in the most oppressive governments, bar none, in the entire region, and that's Saudi Arabia, but he even goes on, on behalf of the U.S. government, to praise the king for the human rights improvement and reforms, ostensibly reforms, that have been going on in that kingdom. Uh, you also see, for example, in the same meeting, the Saudi king brings up the issue of the various restrictions on travelers from Saudi Arabia into the United States. 
And the king asked him that it's very embarrassing to him before friends and foes alike because it gives the impression that United States and Saudi Arabia are not that close as allies. And of course, the American official goes on to underline the extent to which the two countries are very close to each other. What, what, what is very striking about all these documents on the Middle East is that the Arab people are not going to be surprised that much. They all along have known that they are ruled by a bunch of liars and deceivers who go to extra lengths to appease and please the United States. What is going to be particularly revealing are the details, the lengths to which these rulers go in order to please the United States. And we find that they are not capable of making independent decisions. Whatever the instincts of the United States are, those rulers go along with them. And in fact, they seem to compete with one another, uh, for example, in showing how much they are hostile to Iran. And uh, you see, for example, the second person in the United Arab Emirates, uh, a guy who's very influential there, uh, goes on to encourage the United States not only to attack Iran in a variety of sites, but to prepare for a land invasion. I should also say, what is revealing in those documents also, is the utter stupidity of those rulers who, in many of these conversations, seem to think that the United States government really listened to their advice, that they really... Uh, consult with them on a regular basis and as if they are waiting for the opinion of the Egyptian president or the Saudi king before they reach their decisions. And I think they seem to want to flatter themselves because the kind of relationship between these protectorates, and I call them protectorates because that's what they were, say, in the era of the British Empire, and it seems they have not advanced that much in approaching a level of sovereignty that is characterized membership in the United Nations. Uh, and on the question of Israel, what people are going to notice is that the extent to which there is a close coordination between the Israeli government and the American government on all issues pertaining to the Middle East, including Pakistan, and the extent to which that kind of coordination is absent in these discussions between the American officials and the Israelis. I should also say that uh, we have seen documents in which the opinions of the head of the Mossad, Dagan, were detailed by an American, in an American cable. And it is also striking the extent to which that head of the Mossad, highly touted organization, does not seem to have that many insights or information or analysis uh, that is insightful about what's happening in the Middle East. Certainly, the location of Israel is extremely high in the esteem of the United States, but the low esteem to which the Arab governments are held by U.S. officials is quite apparent in these documents. Um, in particular, uh, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia repeatedly calling on the U.S. to attack Iran to destroy its nuclear program, reportedly calling on American officials to cut off the head of the snake. Um, he now, the king, actually is in New York, is that right, for back surgery? Right. He's going to be there for a few weeks, and I think he will be able to see what his media is not showing, the extent to which these revelations are dominating international media. And I should also add, the extent to which they are dominating the underground media or the new media of the Middle East, Twitter and uh, Facebook, all of them are discussing from, I mean, from the Arab world what is happening. And many of them are commenting about the irony. Yesterday, the, the main Saudi news organization, Arabia, kept promising viewers that the leak of the documents is imminent. From 10 minutes from now, we're going to see all these documents. And then once the documents are out, there was complete silence in that news organization. They figured that all these documentations are, in fact, an utter embarrassment to the image of their rulers that they try so hard to prop up in the eyes of the public. I think the Arab public today woke up wiser than before, more cynical than before, and certainly more critical of the government. You see all these governments competing, trying to bring up the issue of Iranian nuclear weapons. Not a single Arab leader in those discussions brought up the issue of the massive Israeli WMDs program that have been going on for decades because they don't dare bring it up. Asad Abu Khalil of uh, Teachers at University of California, Berkeley. Uh, we are talking about this massive WikiLeaks leak, uh, up to 250,000 documents being released over the next few weeks. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Back in a minute.